just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, please mute your microphones during Oliver's presentation. There will be some time afterwards for questions. You can use the reactions button if you want to show thumbs up or applause for anything wonderful that he happens to say. Uh, there will be time, hopefully, for Q&A at the end. We'll have a few seed questions that Blair has, uh, has prepared. And if you want to ask a question, if you look under participants on your screen, there should be a hand that you can raise. And Blair is in charge of keeping, keeping the order of whose hand went up first. So if you look under participants, you should see that. Um, <clears throat> so I'll say bonsoir mes amis and welcome to today's session. My name is Phil Sammer. I'm the president of the Alliance Francaise of Hawaii. And along with AFH, AFH board member Bloon, Blair Boone Migora, we will be your hosts this evening. We are delighted to welcome Oliver G, or should I say Yi, founder, <laughs> I read your book, voice and host behind the Paris-based podcast, The Earful Tower. Recently, Oliver's broadcast was recognized by the New York Times as one of the best travel broadcasts in the world with over 60,000 downloads monthly. Originally from Australia, Oliver lived in Sweden for a few years before moving to Paris in 2015. He just published his first book, his memoir called Paris on Air, which describes in hilarious detail his discovery of the French, their language, and the city of Paris. Now there will be a Q&A session following, presented by my colleague Blair, uh, after which we will conduct a lucky drawing for two of Oliver's books, and here it is. There it is. <laughs> on air, there it is. And these are rare right now, this is first edition. There's yeah. no more first edition available. We'll tell you about that in a minute. <laughs> the uh, book is currently in its second printing, actually. Yes, it's that popular. But it will be available soon for order by mail. And you also get a $5 discount if you use the code AF as in Alliance Francaise, whether it's in caps or small letters. And when it's reissued, we'll retain your email addresses, which shouldn't be too difficult. And we'll alert you when it's again available. In the meantime, Oliver also has an audiobook version, which goes beyond the usual in that it is an interactive audio experience. He has the characters in his book actually reading, reading their lines and uh, presenting the experience. It's available at the same price as the book or as a bundle with the print version. We will send all of tonight's attendees the link to the audio forum as well as the link to the podcast. Now, without further delay, here is Oliver G. Bonsoir et bienvenue. Thank you very much. <laughs> so um, I guess I, I'll, I'll start us off. I, I have my big question, Oliver, is where are you now? You've been living a bit of a gypsy chic life going from Montmartre to the 7th. Uh, and so can you just maybe share with us where you are? And if you'd like, even give us a glimpse of the view. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, have, the, have the people been let in? Have I see, am I seeing the right view here? Yes, there's, right now there's, there's just six. Okay, good, good, yeah. good, good. Um, I, right now we're in, um, uh, it's called, a, a street called Rue Montessui, which is, uh, it's just off, uh, well, I tell you, I can show you, it's probably the easiest way to put us into perspective, but it's the, um, it, just to put the story first, there's a company called Paris Perfect that rents out lovely apartments. I don't live here. Uh, of course, this is far too grand for, for where I am in life. But they, uh, because there are no tourists here at the moment, all their apartment rentals are empty at the moment. So they uh, allowed me and my wife to stay here, which was thrilling because it's probably the most incredible apartment I've been in. And for context of where we are, I'll show you out the window. It's quite early in Paris, so I'll have to keep my voice down. But... <laughs> See if you can see this. Oh my goodness. Wow. Wow. Ooh. Uh, you see? Sunday morning too. There's my scooter. Ah. Red beast. Yeah. That's the one. <laughs> wow. Sunday Excellent. morning. Whoa. And there just out go. of curiosity, what time uh, do your fellow neighbors get going there? Normally I don't know on a Sunday because I, we only just moved yesterday. But, um, pretty, pr it's been pretty early during the week. 
you know like i think um like because there is a cafe just down there they get started they they do up the, the chalkboard and everything pretty quick so it's um i don't know they get going pretty quick i'm surprised but now it's dead so tell us, let's go back in, in time a bit. I know you arrived uh, in 2015 to France to cover uh, the attacks that, uh, on Charlie Hebdo. And um, at that time, uh, working, you were working as a journalist in Sweden and you'd been there, I believe, for about four years. <clears throat> when this opportunity came up, were, <laughs> with someone who'd had some high school and college French, you weren't exactly prepared to be a journalist in, in France. Um, would you say that it was an opportunity that uh, you ran to because it was France or Paris, or was it more you were looking for a new and exciting adventure? Um, I think I think it was kind of a mix of everything. Like my, my I had this strange self confidence in my French ability, which was totally incorrect to have it because I was wrong. Like my French was not good. But it was kind of like I'd always been interested in Paris. I, I hope that for everybody else, on your first trip to Paris, there was some kind of magic in there. Mine was. Um, and I, when this job opportunity came available, uh, I applied for it and I got it. And I was like, yep, this is going to be a new start. This is going to be cool. The French bit I'll figure out when I got there. Mm. And uh, I kind of did, but it wasn't quick. It wasn't quick at all. But I don't know. There were a lot of, it felt like the stars were all aligning. And I think many people, if they got a job opportunity in Paris, would be on the next plane as well. I think. I like to hope so anyway. Absolutely. So I did it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would think so as well. But for you, upon arrival, I think there, and you write about this in the book with such um, amazing humor, but there were quite a few bit of faux pas, <laughs> language faux pas, um, because obviously you, you have your full range of expression. Um, uh, in terms of uh, your language skills at that time. So can you maybe share some of the, what some of those were like for those uh, who have yet to, without spoiling the book, maybe give us a little teaser of what some of the language faux pas were that sure. uh, you can chuckle about now. Like, yeah, <laughs> I'm happy to spoil parts of the book. There's, uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the mistakes that um, remains one of the most embarrassing thing as you read in the book, Blair, but I'll sort of tell it differently, I guess, is when I went to the, um, the basketball courts and you can say like like they don't really teach maybe they teach you at Alliance Francaise in the States and in well and your in your Alliance Francaise perhaps you guys know all the slang I don't know is that something that, that is covered slang no no I think uh it, to your point we're hoping to actually have a uh, someone French teach a little class on idiomatic expressions in um, our goal because it's not really yeah right well same with everything I'd learn they maybe touched on it before and I'm fascinated. I love learning sort of as I go with, with a language and with French and they use every single uh, sort of permutation of the word dude when they're talking to each other. <laughs> These basketball guys, when I went down there and played and they'd say, uh, mon, like they always put mon at the start, like mon gars, mon, mon pote, mon bro, mon ami, all these things. It's really cool. And the other word they always say is mec, which also means dude. <clears throat> for some reason you can't say mon mec which i had no idea and i was saying it for months and it wasn't until i sent it in an email to a friend of mine who responded when you say mon mec it's the same as saying like my darling or my love <laughs> and like honestly i was walking down the basketball court doing the fist bump with everyone salut mon mec ça va mon mec uh, and you know i don't know why no one told me at the beginning but um yeah they were all my my darlings for months <laughs> And I continue to make mistakes all the time, but I, I don't mind it because it makes for a good story and I, I'm lucky to have a platform to tell it. So any kind of embarrassment that I suffer, I'm just like, oh, well, I'll put that one in the, in the uh, story bank for later, you know? Yeah. Well, you're lucky you didn't get asked out for dinner or a drink after. <laughs> That's true. It could the, the Paris on air could have gone a whole different way <laughs> if I had uh, accepted one of those drinks. So there's an expression, you know, uh, speak another language, live another soul. Would you say that um, there's a different personality or flavor to the, per uh, to the personality of uh, English-speaking Oliver versus French-speaking Oliver versus Swedish-speaking Oliver? Are you yeah, I love that question and that quote. Thank you for asking it. And I don't quite know the answer, but I do know that, um, like, like, 
I know my personality in English and it's the kind of personality that can have a podcast and be sort of mildly witty and amusing sometimes, right? But when I speak French, it's not the same thing. I try and be funny, but it's not the same. And in Swedish, which I speak much like, like very well, I speak fluent Swedish, I'm still not the same person. And I find it really interesting to think that there's a French Oliver and, a, and an English speaking Oliver that are so different. Like, what did you say? Speak a different language, experience a different soul or something? Live another soul. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I love it because I think it's so interesting to, especially people who are fully bilingual, like, like from birth. I always find it fascinating to see how different they are in the different languages. But um, I hope one day that French Oliver and Swedish Oliver and, and Australian Oliver will meet and have a conversation. <laughs> At the moment, they're quite far away from each other, I think. So I don't know, like... One thing I find interesting is sometimes in French, and I speak pr pretty good French, but I'll still try and be funny, but the jokes aren't funny. But yeah. I think it shows my, you know, like if I'm in a cafe and they say something, I try and make it just an offhand, off the cuff joke. Like, I think they go, oh, this guy's trying to be funny, but he's a foreigner, but I get it. He's a kind of fun dude. I get it. Whereas in English, maybe they'd laugh or whatever. So it's, it's a bit different, but at the same time, it's kind of similar. But it's really, it's this super intriguing thing how people are different in, in different languages. So I don't know, maybe I got three souls. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, well you're certainly on the, on the cusp of being a polyglot, wouldn't you say? Sure, sure. I think um, I, came, I made up a word the other day, Blair, that you might like. That's someone who speaks, and I think I'm dangerously on the cusp of this. Anyone who speaks several languages and brags about it, which I don't want to do, but they become a polygloat. Ah, I like so I don't want to come across as a polyglot, but I'm, I, you know, I think if I really put my head down, I could, I could nail French, and then maybe I could get away with it, polygloating <laughs> around the world. So I, I mean, I, I can't help but marvel this impressive background of an apartment that you're sitting in, and it makes me think to back to your book about your first apartment in France. Um, can you maybe uh, tell everyone here on the Zoom call? First, how tall you are, and then tell them about the apartment. Sure. Okay, everyone, I'm six foot three, or 191 centimeters, I think. And uh, the, <laughs> the apartment was, I don't know it in square feet, but it was 19 square meters. Maybe someone can look it up, but that's not much. Uh, and, uh, well, okay, this room is probably... This room is probably about the same size as my entire first apartment or maybe bigger. It's hard to say, but, um, it was, it was, it was cramped because it was a Chambre de Bonne, which is uh, as many of you guys probably know, uh, um, uh, a maid's quarters up on the top of the roof, under the ceiling, under the roof and the ceiling slanted like this. So the bed was under the slant, the shower was under the slant. Um, and it was, it was, it was difficult. And I lived there with uh, the woman who's now my wife for two years. So it's crazy, as you said, Blair, like it's crazy to be sitting in terms of a story arc of where I've gone from struggling. You know, obviously I don't actually live here, but um, you know, going from that to this kind of place, it's, it's just crazy. Like it's crazy how the past few years have gone, uh, all thanks to starting a podcast, I think. But, um, but that was a really tiny, tiny, tiny apartment. And the thing is, like, especially compared to you guys living in the States or in Australia where everything's a lot bigger. But when you're in Paris, like currently I live in a 30 meter squared one, which is maybe more like the size of this, uh, this living room. And during the lockdown, I'd uh, sometimes catch myself out. Like I'd be talking to someone, uh, for example, the guy that sells the wine around the corner from my place on uh, Rue des Abbes. I was like, whoa, the lockdown was tough and we're just in 30 meters squared. And he goes, whoa. And I was like, yeah, it's pretty small, huh? And he goes, I'm in 20 meters squared with my wife. And I was like, oh, God. So people, some people in the city really do live smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. Um, so it makes it all the more lovely to be in a place like this. Yeah. And it's just you said that they don't count this area underneath the eaves. Exactly right. So, so I mean, when I say 19 square meters, uh, it was probably more like 24 or something, but I think it's fair that they don't count it under the eaves because uh, like if you wake up in the, in, with a start in the middle of the night, you'll hit your head on the, 
on the slanted ceiling. So I don't know. It was it was it was a good introduction to Paris. I think uh, when people are starting out here or if they're students, it's a perfect way to start. But there's a time limit for how long you can stay in those kind of places. Yeah, two years. Well, in spite of the shelf life, I think uh, you certainly had uh, what you describe in the book quite a view yet from a bathroom, but still there was quite a view. And what was the view of? Um, so it, it was kind of weird. Like it went straight towards the Eiffel Tower that seemed, the Eiffel Tower is weird. Like sometimes it seems big when you're far away, depending on what's in front of it and uh, what's around it. Or if it's just like from that place, it seemed really big, but from, we were, we were in the second that just near Rue Montaguay. So it was quite far away, but it was like this unobstructed view. You had to climb over the toilet sort of and stand like with your face to the, like a prisoner sort of, I suppose. Uh, but it was a great, great view. Not, com not anything near compared to that Eiffel Tower I just showed you then, but it was unobstructed and beautiful. And uh, when you're new to it, or when you're new to a view of the Eiffel Tower, you tend to be obsessed with it. You know, like when, when I'm here, I stand on the balcony just looking at it, even though I've been here for five years. Or right. when we moved to Montmartre, we had another view of it. And um, I don't know, there's some kind of magic. I get why people are very obsessed with that. It's, it's not anything on the Aloha Tower behind you there, Blair, but it's a pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to say, I wanted to recommend a film, um, Les Femmes du Sixième Etage. Did you ever mm -hmm. see that? Mm -hmm. It's hilarious and uh, you really like it, having stayed in the Chambre de Bonne. I'll have to look it up, thank you. Yes, good movie. I, I saw it. Very good movie. Good recommendation. It's kind of ironic when you think that the Eiffel Tower was, was not liked when it was built, you know? Yeah. Sure. And an eyesore when it was built. Actually, in the apartment you are, and uh, all along Avenue de la Bourdonnais, those apartments were built for the workers who constructed the Eiffel. Yeah. I didn't know they told you that. No, but I'd heard of uh, the same story for places on Rue Saint Dominique. So it, may, it wouldn't surprise me if the whole, yeah, I mean, that wouldn't whole area. Of workers. Yeah, amazing. Because this, was, was, this place, this would have been for one of the the higher up dudes, I reckon. As in the one <laughs> we're with Paris right Perfect now. too. You know Pardon? Paris Perfect. Uh, we're with Paris Perfect as well. With Lisa, have you met Lisa and Hilda? No, no, I only know Lisa. Yeah. Oh, at the office at 12 um, Rue, uh, what street is it? Grinnell, I think. No, no, the, their office, the Paris oh. Perfect office. Sure, no, I haven't met them yet. <laughs> so uh, let's turn to the, to the since we're um, about to head into the territory of the book, we'll, we'll circle back and talk a bit about the podcast, but I'd be interested in um, just using as a kind of point of, a point de départ, the Paris on Air, your book. Um, in terms of, you know, when I was reading it, it was hilarious laugh out loud moments um, that we'll get into. But one of the things that I was struck by is it's not just a memoir or a collection of your observations um, and recollections of a, during this period in France. It's really very romantic and a love story. Um, you know, obviously a love story in, in terms of falling in love with various districts, arrondissements, and um, various areas and places in France, but it, you know, it's where you met your now wife and um, you, it was kind of an accident. <laughs> you went on your, uh, I think it was first or second date on Valentine's Day, not even realizing it was Valentine's Day. Yeah. Um, and, and then this was the woman that you ultimately married. What is it like falling in love in the city of what we traditionally think of as lights and love? You know, it's, it's yeah. got to be very romantic. That, that yeah. oozed through the book. Thank you for that lovely review. That's very kind of you. It's, um, I'm glad you enjoyed it as well. The, um, it's, it's another good question because, and I don't know how deeply I got into it in the book, but it was really wonderful to fall in love with someone in a city like this. I think I touched on that idea of um, how it would be really nice to be here with a French person in that they tell you which yogurt is the best one mm -hmm. to buy or what street you should never go down or whatever like that is handy but when you're like I'm, I assume everyone's been to Paris in this zoom chat um, when you're here with someone and you're exploring it and it's kind of like a date uh, even if you're on holiday it's just this magic to it like you you're like what's over here like I, did, I know I didn't write it in the book because I just thought about it the other day but crossing the bridges at night in the center of Paris is at night, like I mean midnight, 
is such a beautiful and romantic thing to do. And I was doing it the other night just by myself. It was a lot less <laughs> romantic, actually. But it reminded me of when I first moved here with Lena. Uh, well, I didn't move with her, but when I first moved here and started seeing Lena, and we'd walk at night, and it was just like, I mean, maybe it was the maybe it was the woman, but I think it was a, a lot of Paris, just super. It's just super beautiful. And so when you have this uh, kind of this all this happening plus that feeling of being on holidays because we were both so new here and we didn't know where we were going it's like this electricity in the air and it shows off i should have written this because i realized it, it's <laughs> it's cool but when you go into a, a restaurant or something and you're with someone you just started seeing and you're feeling this beautiful city and it's just amazing it vibrates out into the air so when the waiter comes you're going to be way more friendly and talkative and then they they love it because they have so many people Parisians who don't care or tourists who might be rude or whatever. So that when you come in and you're beaming, they're going to be like drinks are on the house or whatever, you know, we are, we recommend this come and sit in the best seat. So it just keeps, um, I don't know, snowballing. So to answer the question in short, it's a very good city to fall in love with. And if you're not all in love already, I recommend you all move here directly <laughs> and do it. Or talk our talk our husbands or wives into moving there. That's that's, that's the next I'm, best thing. That's what yeah. I'm working on. <laughs> good luck, good luck. I hope it happens. Um, so, in, in terms of other rites of passage, passages uh, in life, birthdays celebrated in France. You write in the book about uh, your 30th birthday, which was just a uh, rather hedonistic view uh, or moment in time, which I loved reading about because it was be very easy to visualize. But um, can you maybe talk about a bit about that experience and uh, the financial position you found yourself in trying yeah. for that? Yeah. So the thing that happens when you rent a chateau in the countryside of France is it's uh, even though they're quite cheap to buy, if you're renting it for 30 people, it's going to, and if you're anything like me, it's going to empty your bank account, which leads down to a, a, a huge rabbit hole of complications in the book. Um, but renting the chateau was one of the best things, and everyone still talks about it to this day, years later. But uh, it's like I've, everyone should do that too: is rent a chateau and bring some friends, uh, because there's so many of them. That, I wrote it in the book. I, mean, I can't remember. There's hundreds of them, hundreds of on Airbnb. Just that's just on Airbnb. Like there's many, many hundreds more. Um, but in terms of a way to celebrate the a birthday in France, I can't think of many better ways. And it was pretty wild. Like it was, <laughs> it was a pretty crazy night, but I think, I think it kind of suits a chateau to be, to be uh, a bit crazy like that. And then in the book, I wrote what happened at the end of the night from the perspective of a GoPro camera that was attached to the wall rather than getting into too many sordid details, but I'll leave that to your imagination or to your reading when yeah. you get to it. But uh, yeah, it was wonderful. I, and people still plan, like I plan to do it again in some form because it was just such a, such a cool thing to do. Especially like as you guys in the States and me as an Australian, we don't have, um, what is it, 400 year old buildings that are still, you know, like, you know, it's just a whole different ball game. So I love it. I love it. Well, highly recommend it. Excellent to read about. So I, I highly recommend that uh, for those of you um, who haven't read the book yet, drink that chapter in slowly because you'll, you'll chuckle, uh, if not laugh out loud. Um, <laughs> it doesn't happen to be September 30th, does it? September 21st. Why do you ask? Because I was born on the 30th. So. Ah, almost. A few years later than you, uh, before you, so. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but you, now you, if, um, you know, some of us up here I know have, have lived in France and, uh, one of the things that you wrote about that really struck a chord with me was the bureaucracy and with French administration. Um, and oh my goodness, you, you really, I thought, outlined pretty with such clarity what it's like, the frustration one feels with mm. opening bank accounts. Um, try closing a bank account there, that's even worse. Um, mm -hmm. So can you maybe share a little bit about uh, what that was like and the dreaded dossier because I know oh. we're going to uh, you and Lena almost found the perfect apartment. You were, uh, a drag queen was going to bequeath you with her apartment well, because she was leveling up. And unfortunately, the dossier prevented that. So maybe talk about yeah. that. And then, and then the apartment sashayed away right in front of me. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, it's, the dossier is really annoying because as with a lot of French admin and what I write in the book is that you just have to go in accepting defeat already because you typically will like, I didn't want to get into way too much detail about it because it is so, it can be so boring mm. like to get to fail all the time. But if you go in there expecting to fail, it makes it kind of fun. Uh, so you go in and they go, Oh, but you're missing your, the dental records of your first dog. And you're like, Oh, ah, oh, yeah. Okay. Well that's kind of, you know, but, um, as for the apartment and the dossier, it's especially when you're young and you're, um, you're on your first, you know, like a kind of low salary as I was. And, uh, my wife was working for a Swedish company. They, you're very undesirable compared to, especially compared to a French person who's got a, a legit job and a good salary. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those perfect apartments escaped us. And, uh, it's just, it's very draining, you know, like you end up like it, it can be really fun to search for an apartment, for example, because you can dream and be like, wow, this would be cool. But, um, and we're kind of there now, like we're, we're thinking to get a bigger place, but the whole dossier, which is essentially proving your income and how reliable you'll be and everything. Um, it just, it's not, a, it's not my happy place to be. Yeah. To be fair. So um, the trick is, like I said, if you just, the trick is twofold. You, you accept that you're going to lose every battle and then you're elated when you win. And the other trick is get lots of friends in Paris because that is the way to find um, nice apartments without them getting difficult with you, I suppose. And the third trick is start a podcast and write a book. <laughs> and Paris Perfect will let you stay in their place during the summer. So there's, there's my three pronged attack. If you guys need a place. Yeah. Well, actually the other, the other piece of information that I found quite useful um, is the chapter in which you talked about, I think it related back to your 30th birth. No, it was the cable. And um, I loved the instruction, the information that uh, being kind of assertive uh, in these situations also helps because I think your friend called the cable company and, you know, just unleashed a tirade. <laughs> That's the, yeah, you've got it. And that bit was pretty good in the, uh, the audio experience too, I thought. Did you? The, Hilarious. The, yeah, that, that guy was an actual actor, like a proper legit actor in England who, uh, who, cause he had the English accent. He was so good. Anyway. Um, yeah. If you have a, um, if you have a strong argument and you speak good French, it makes a very big difference as well, which anyone who's just moved here, like I had, uh, and I still wouldn't be that good at it actually. But if you can go and say like, what are you talking about? That's ridiculous. Uh, how can you say this when this, then it makes a big difference. I think French people actually kind of admire it. I remember I was at the post office during the, um, as the deconfinement was happening and a guy walked up to the entry where they have like a security dude or whatever. And the guy said, no, we're closed. You won't be able to get in. And then I, and for me, usually that means they're closed and walk away. But I was watching and I saw this guy. I was like, that guy's definitely going to get in. And I watched him. This is just like a month ago. And, uh, he, he didn't really argue, but he convinced the security guard that he should be let in. And he was, and it was incredible. So there's this, um, there's this moment of, I had, someone wrote a book about like, no, the first no from a French person doesn't necessarily mean no, it means more like convince me. I think ah. that's really true. Um, but you have to be able to convince and that's actually the hardest bit. So, yeah, that's interesting. Speaking. No, that's very good, a good advice <clears throat> uh, and a good, uh, something good to keep in mind. Um, okay, before launching into the podcast, I do want to ask one question about something that you wrote in the book that I, uh, I, I found interesting. You said that Paris is not France and France is not Paris. Um, and I couldn't help but think, you know, especially because you had an opportunity um, to, to go through France on the Red Beast with Lena, that you got an opportunity to really see different aspects of uh, the French population. and. Mm -hmm. And thinking of sometimes the stereotypes that arise of North versus South or, um, you know, a metropolitan city versus the country, uh, would you say, what would you say is the Parisian view of the rest of France and what is the rest of France's view of Paris? I think, uh, I th well, the, the rest of France view is the easy one because they, um, I was consistently stunned at how few people cared about Paris and wanting to be here, especially compared to the fact that everyone in the world seems to want to come to Paris. But French people off like really often 
would just don't care, you know, and that was a mix of reasons. Like mo mainly it was, I was too busy, too many people. Some people would joke. Um, well, maybe they weren't joking, but they'd say, Oh, it's full of Parisians. Why would I want to be there? Um, there's a lot of that kind of talk. And at first I was really stunned by it because I've chosen to live here. I love it. My job is promoting Paris. And then people would consistently say that they didn't care for it. Uh, but you know, and I'd, even, I'd be like, what about the, the Musée d'Orsay and the Louvre and stuff? And they go, yeah, if I go there, I would check that stuff out, but I could never live there. So there's that um, one-way kind of thing. And then the Parisians probably would think that they're all jealous and actually wish that they lived here and had this kind of life. But Parisians seem to me to typically, um, you know, like not, not envy their life, but envy that they are out in the countryside. Parisian people tend to love the countryside. They escape to, well, as I'm sure you know, to Nice or Deauville or, or um, Biarritz or whatever all the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think, uh, I think, <laughs> I know Parisians sort of make fun of, what do they call it, Provence, like the countryside as a sort of the butt of the joke. But deep down, I think everybody loves each other. And I think, uh, I think they all, um, they're all very sort of regionally proud Parisians typically come from Brittany or, or Nice or whatever. And, uh, and as a tip, they love when you know the country. So if you guys meet a French person and they say, Oh, I'm from Paris, but really I'm from Bordeaux and you know, Bordeaux or, you know, whatever town, or if you can say whereabouts, what is the small village you come from near Bordeaux? They, they love it. Like beyond everything. I think they're kind of sick of tourists, or people that when someone says, oh, I'm French, and they go, where are you from, Paris? And that's all they got. You know, like they, they appreciate the effort. So that was a long-winded answer to a simple question. No, that's it's a great answer, actually. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think. So we'll, we'll, get, we'll return to the book, certainly when uh, we open it, the floor to questions. But I would like to talk about uh, your podcast, The Earful Tower. Uh, firstly, could you maybe encapsulate, tell us a little bit um, about uh, what it is for those who have never listened. Uh, you've had some amazing guests on, um, ambassadors, mayors of cities, um, fashion icons and models like uh, Caroline de Maigret. I mm. love that, uh, that interview. So just tell us a little bit about um, the idea of where it came and then what you've been doing lately. Sure. I think the podcast for anyone who has never listened to it is, uh, it's like 30 minute episode every Monday, typically with a guest. And I think, I think I've been thinking about a lot what separates it from other podcasts. Mm. Uh, Cause there are a bunch of other similar kind of Paris podcasts. And I think it's just, um, I think the word is entertaining. I think it's entertaining. It's not me saying that I'm entertaining. It's the chance to hear either the guests talk about their Paris or, you know, I'll record episodes in a cafe with a supermodel which will feel that it's entertaining. You feel that you're in the city with us, things like that. Um, and, uh, and a lot of adventure on it too. So it's kind of this, people often email me and say that they feel that they're in Paris, even for just half an hour mm -hmm. um, with me every week, I guess. And it's, uh, yeah, like you said, Blair, lots of different guests, good conversation, trying to um, find out more about the real guest of every single episode, which is Paris. And then, um, yeah, it's just to, to sum it up in like one sentence. I started it as a hobby and now it just keeps growing because I guess people keep recommending it to each other. And now it's, I think it's, it's kind of one of the, I think it's one of the top, sometimes it is the top travel podcast in the world. You can look at the um, stats of it, like the comparable stats, but uh, I still kind of treat it like a hobby, you know, it's like... <laughs> something I really enjoy doing and it gets, gets to open a lot of doors. I get to meet a lot of people. So it's been a, a really cool run so far. So, well, um, yeah. Do what you love and you'll never be bored a day in your life. Exactly. Like, like yeah. you're doing that. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, uh, I love having this opportunity to speak with you because um, I started listening. It's not as if I started listening to this, your podcast, because uh, in preparation for this, I just happened, you know, Pahaza just stumbled across your podcast at the start of the year. And I was like, oh, what a cool podcast and started listening. And then this opportunity came up. I, I was like, wow, I'm already yeah. listening to that. I would love to speak to it's uh, so cool. Oliver. Yeah, I mean, I, and I know that Stacy as well on here, we, we uh, love finding great mixology places. So I loved the episodes that you've done on, on 
uh, hidden speakeasies and yeah. uh, great cock where to find the best cocktails uh, <laughs> in Paris. Um, yeah. You know, we, the, I listened to the uh, episode that you did on Black Lives Matter, and I thought that was interesting because obviously that was, um, you know, a, such a, a, a moment of civil discourse mm -hmm. and uh, dem with the demonstrations here in the U.S. But what I think a lot of people aren't aware of, um, and I certainly enjoyed finding out through your, um, your podcast, was that that was going on in France, too, for slightly different reasons, but, mm -hmm. um, uh, but it was going on in France as well. Can you talk a little bit about that and the commitment that you made um, on your program to uh, turn to people of color to amplify uh, those voices mm -hmm. in France? Yeah, so it was, it was interesting. It was pretty similar, similar to what was happening in the States in that uh, a super similar thing had happened. Uh, someone had died in police custody in Paris, but it was a few years ago. Like long story short, the um, coroner's report came through and uh, it seemed conflicting. Like no one knew what to believe really. And so they wanted to protest it. And this coroner's report came out from this black person that had died at about the same time as everything was picking up in the States. So it kind of melded together into a big French thing as well. Um, so they, they picked up the Black Lives Matter. They did it their own way, but it was, you know, there were pictures of George Floyd and stuff like that. And so it was very... Um, sort of pertinent here and, and picked up a lot of energy and steam and a, a conversation started. And uh, to answer your question, what I did on the, on the podcast was um, sort of, I, I took a look at everything and, and I, you know, I really didn't want to just do a, like a black Instagram, whatever you call it, like mm -hmm. black it out and go, yeah, let's get on with it. So we did a big um, fundraiser where uh, there's a really cool, charity in Paris that's run by an American woman. It's called uh, the Wells Institute and, uh, or the Wells International Foundation. And so what we did is we did raffle tickets. I went and I bought a lot of cool prizes from prominent African American and not just African American, like Jamaican, all kinds of uh, black voices in Paris used them as prizes. And we raised, I think it was $11,000 in like four days for that charity while promoting the voices of people who, um, you know, deserve to be heard as well. So I took it pretty seriously. And that's, I think that's kind of one of the cool things about the podcast. Like after being a journalist and having a boss who would edit every sentence or tell you exactly what to do is when you've got your own show that you can do anything you want. So uh, it was pretty cool to have the freedom to dive down that uh, for the past couple of weeks. And uh, it was a pretty exhausting um, taking a total turn from what I usually do, but it was really interesting and cool and I think important. So um yeah i don't know i yeah that was just the direction i went and i thought it was i thought it was good you know yeah, you know you know in looking at uh who's on the uh, on the call today we there's a pretty sophisticated in terms of travelers um to france but what the thing that i encourage you all to to take a moment to read either read the book or listen to the virtual book is because it's not just for those who don't have much experience in France. I found it as someone who lived in France and speaks French, I found it, and I, the same with Phil. We were talking before you got on, Oliver. It's equally as entertaining and enjoyable for people who have a familiarity with France as everyone here uh, on this particular call does. So that's mm -hmm. what makes it so wonderful is it's not just for, uh, mm -hmm. and the same goes true with your podcast. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's why, I, that's how I stumbled across it because since I don't live in France now, and a city like Paris changes so, so drastically, um, mm -hmm. certainly since the time that I lived, I lived there in the 90s. So I needed to know when I go back, rather than waste time, where do I go find that speakeasy? Or, sure. You know, yeah. so I think it's a, a really valuable resource. For Thank you. People, even, uh, you know, steeped in French culture. Mm, it's funny. I remember I got an email from someone who, uh, I don't often get really negative emails, but once they were like, your sh they, no, no, they said, um, when I started listening to your show, I was sitting there going, oh my God, oh my God, this, this guest has no idea, this host has no idea. And in the early days, it's true, because I was trying to figure out France. In fact, that's how I build it. I was like, Oliver G, figuring out France. And I didn't know, so I was asking stupid questions, I was learning. Uh, but then this email continued that oh, they kept listening. They must have got addicted to it or something. But then over the years, it's 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 grown and the guests are more sophisticated. And my questions maybe too. And my understanding is, and now uh, it's this woman who's lived in Paris forever. And now she like looks forward to every episode. 
So um, it's kind of cool because it gets, like you say, it gets more um, relevant or, you know, as I get to know the city really well, I'm not going to be asking questions anymore. Like, well, how does the Metro work? You know, like, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, you know, so it's cool. like when I did, I did a walk with the, um, the mayor of Montmartre last, this week, this week it's just happened. And when we were walking through, he said, well, I think you know Montmartre better than I do. And I was like, oh my gosh, I got to write that one down and put it on oh, the wow. back. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's cool. It's, it's been a growing thing for everybody, especially me, but it's been cool to take everyone along on the journey. Yeah. So I, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about the virtual audio, um, the audio, audio experience, because I know it's not easy to, to, in terms of how you wanted to package it, but I loved it. Hearing your mother's French was probably one of the highlights for me. Um, oh, great. That was hilarious. Uh, just h hearing Lena's voice, you know, was great. So I think it's a wonderful tool. Do you want to tell everyone about it? Firstly, Blair, I think I need to hire you as my like spokesperson or something because <laughs> you you are amazing. But um, it's it's the idea is I think audiobooks typically are pretty lame. Like, I actually think so. Mm -hmm. I I never listen to them because I think it's boring. Often it's a different person is reading it to whoever the author was which I, I don't get that at all but I wanted to do it really properly where I read it and where every character is either voiced by that person or an actor who because you know sometimes if it's the janitor of a, a language school which isn't in the book or whatever I can't go back and track down that janitor so I got people to sort of voice characters I must have had 20 or 30 I don't know maybe 20 30 people uh, lended their voice to it plus music and uh at the end of some chapters, like if Lena, my wife was in it, I'd, when the chapter finished, I'd be like, so let's talk about that a little bit and got a little bit behind the scenes. And because it's um, audio books aren't typically like that, I think, uh, I don't know, it's been hard for me to get the same kind of excitement about it as a book, because a book is that you hold it, everyone understands it. But um, I'm gonna focus on pushing that a little bit because I think it's, I think you're right, Blair. I think it's a really fun ride. I hope people take that journey with me because um yeah i think i'm a podcaster so if there's one thing i should be able to do is an audio book <laughs> so i'm you know i i could go on forever but i, I want to also respect be respectful of the time and uh and open it up to questions before uh we let you go on with your day and have breakfast but my last one is actually um going to be several questions in one i thought we'd do kind of a rapid fire Great. So I'm going to ask you, and you just, one, one word is fine. If you want to um, expound upon it, you're free to do that. Yeah. Um, because when I was reading in uh, the book, you talked about uh, the Rue des Abbes being your favorite street. Um, and that, prompt, that got me to thinking, um, what are some of your other favorites? So I'm just going to run down the list. You can say. Best brand of French yogurt? Oh, man. Um, je, je vais. Okay. Uh, telephone company with the worst reputation. You mentioned this in the book, but you never gave us an answer. Free. Free is terrible. Never <laughs> get free. Uh, best place for a quiet romantic date where you can steal a kiss. Um, maybe I'd say like a walk, like go down to like one of the, go down to the Ile, no, what's it called? The Square de Vert Galon, the one that's down by the Pont Neuf. Loop around that thing, little kiss at the end. Ooh, nice. Best terrace cafe to people watch? Oh, I found it the other day. It was um, it was on uh, Rue Claire, one of those sort of overpriced, I don't know what it's called, right in the middle of Rue Claire, uh, the big terraces, lots of people walking down the middle, Aperol spritz. <laughs> Best place for a cocktail? Similar to the um, Okay, no, no, there's... Um, what is your... Okay, yeah, yeah, there's a place called um, Silencio. Have you heard of this? No. It's, uh, I don't think I've ever talked about on the show. It's, who's the guy that made Mulholland Drive? Lynch? Jeff? Oh, Jeff, wow. David, David. David Lynch? David, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. Go there. It's absolutely, well, I went there totally sober and I walked in there and I felt like I was drunk or on drugs or something because it was like, <laughs> and then the cocktails were good too. Excellent. <laughs> um, most underrated place? Um, I think at uh, Butokai down in the 13th, the neighborhood, sort of pedestrianized, really cool, no one goes there. Overrated place? Um, 
This is fun. I'm enjoying this. Um, most overrated place. It. Uh, I think maybe like one of those sort of La Dure or Angelina kind of places. They're great, but people think they're too great. Uh, favorite place to catch a French movie? Oh, um, oh, I mean, you're in France, so I suppose to see a movie. <laughs> there's yeah, there's a really cool cinema in. Um, Clichy, like plastic Clichy, and I went there for a, they have a little restaurant on the second floor you'd never know about unless you lived here. Uh, so go there. I don't know what it's called. It could be Pate or something like that. You'd have to ask me on a non quick fire round. Got it. Um, last two, uh, favorite French TV show? I don't really have one. I haven't, I haven't, I have to pass on that because I never switch on the TV here. Don't watch it. You don't have the time. You're running a podcast, writing a <laughs> memoir, doing 20 plus Alliance Francaise uh, Zoom. It's true. Show. It's true. And the last one, the best place to park a scooter like the Red Beast to avoid tickets or it from being stolen. Yeah. Um, I th uh, within sight. That's the secret. <laughs> yeah. Like right now, it's the perfect place. Fair enough. Well, we've covered a lot of ground, but I want to see if there are some questions um, from anyone, uh, from uh, if anyone would like to speak with Oliver directly. Oh, Great yes. My round. So you can unmute yourselves and then um, maybe we'll start with Pat and then uh, Josette. Uh, and we'll start that way. And then I was thinking that little cafe you're thinking about or a place uh, to people watch on the Rue Claire is called Au Petit Claire. And I actually had... Uh, uh, lunch there with Magda, whom our alliance knows, and her sister before she passed away. Oh, oh wow, that's that's lovely. Oh, it's Claire. A, oh, pretty clear. Okay, yeah. I think there's I think there's two big ones with terraces on either side of a street. Is that the one you're thinking of? Yeah. This one's on the left as you walk uh, from Saint Dominique. It's on oh, the left side. It could well be the same one. Yeah. <laughs> lovely. Very popular. Oh, Oliver, I turn to Pat when I'm traveling to Paris because she, she always has the best recommendations. <laughs> uh, that's good to know. Okay, we need to talk, Pat. But when, when, you, when I think that you're just um, like two minutes from where we are uh, on the next street, uh, we're right next to the American Library, one of our places. Isn't the American but, Library on this street? It's on the next street, uh, Rue du Général Camus. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 that makes sense. Yeah, yep, there's, yep. A, there's a building with a little blue door before you get there. Oh, that's, that's so, and is that just also sitting empty? Do you rent it out usually? It's sitting empty right now. It's such a shame, or, isn't it? Or a, friend, a student was living there, a friend's mm -hmm. son who's getting his mm -hmm. master's there, but um, he went to his apartment because it's empty too. Yeah, the whole city's empty. It's pretty weird. And now I, I think our, our cherished president actually had a question too, Josette. Yeah, just a, a little uh, point of information. This is obviously the Seine. Yes. And this is Waikiki. Um, the first question is, what kind of release form do we all need to sign to be on your next or uh, book, podcast, or whatever? But uh, no, seriously, if you, if you were to leave, if you were to have to leave Paris uh, in the next month, what would make, what about Paris would make you the most homesick? Um, not a, may, maybe not a restaurant, maybe not, uh, but just sure. what? More vibe, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think I find the, um, the approach to life really enjoyable here. And I, uh, like, for example, in, it took me a while to get used to. Uh, so I lived in Sweden for five years before. And in Sweden, everything works. It's really easy. And uh, everyone sort of knows what they want in terms of if you go into the food shop, you go and get it. Whereas when I moved here and people would have these long discussions with the baker or the wine seller or the butcher or whatever, at first I found it so irritating. I was like, <laughs> there shouldn't be a line here just grab whatever you want because people go to the front of the line and they say like what's good today and I was like I could never understand it but now that I understand it and I speak French well enough to to do the same thing and to have you know to appreciate a conversation uh, with someone selling cheese now I would really miss it I think and I know like in Australia where I'm from that they don't do that as much like uh, you don't go in and chat about you know what bread is good or whatever 
So I'd miss that, I think, especially if I were to move to a country like Sweden, where my wife's from, where food isn't uh, anywhere near as big a part of daily life. Yeah, so, so where, where I live in France, um, here in the United States, uh, the, 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 the vendor feels they want, they want to um, make themselves important to the, the customer. I, I, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not explaining this very well, but in France, you have to show your loyalty first and then, you know, sure. you're, you're, um, you're in. Yeah, yeah. I think so it's, right. it's, yeah, it's, a, it's different. It's, it takes a bit of work, but um, after a while, you know, you feel like you're accepted or welcome. Sure. More welcome. There's, yeah. yeah, there's a whole different, I, I traveled a little bit in the States and it feels like uh, even just a, a waiter or a waitress at a restaurant, it's a whole different relationship. Everything is super different. Like I remember when I traveled in the States, I thought everyone was so friendly and nice. Mm-hmm. And then someone said they just, they work for tips. Like they literally just want a tip. I'm sure some of them were really nice, but here, you know, that if someone's being really nice for you, they don't even care if you tip them at all because mm-hmm. often they've got a good, good enough salary anyway. Yep. Uh, and so if someone's being really nice to you, there's no question that they're just a nice person. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I find that all really fascinating too, you know, like, um, it, yeah, so it extends beyond just the shops. It can be, it can be anywhere really. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Good fodder for a second book, I think. Josette, sure. thank you for that. I'll give you You're your welcome. later. Okay. Thank well, you, you. you have, it's funny because you write about this in the book. You have such a, a life of happenstance in so many occasions, but I love the, the manner in which um, I think uh, for your uh, honeymoon, was it your honeymoon, but you're often given, you and Lena were given free meals and yeah. uh, not only free drinks, but free meals. And I think that that uh, it was because they recognized you were new to the neighborhood or they were yeah. a couple in love. And I love those images of France being, oh, you're part of our little mini family. So we're going to yeah. give to you. I think, um, I, th- I don't know. I think like, when you say that, I hope it doesn't come across when I do all that kind of stuff that I'm out looking for free stuff or whatever. No, like that. No, it's, no. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite, it is, I think there's an energy when, like, here's a good example. Like yesterday I went to a cafe called Judy. Maybe you know it, uh, Pat. It's called Judy. It's just near Luxembourg yeah. Gardens, actually. And it was really lovely and we we're sitting there and I was asking questions and I, and I was being very friendly with the, the waitress and, and as was my wife. And then she said, oh, the woman that runs this place is Australian. And I was like, oh, great. Oh, I'd love to maybe chat to her. You know, I've got a podcast, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, at the end, she brought out a, um, it was small, but a little gift for us. And I think like free coffee or something. And she, you, she could tell that she was appreciative that we had a chat with her rather than just two coffees. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You know, well, like when I go to um, the supermarket, I, it's in the book. I always, without fail, will say, um, bonjour, ça va, you know, but I mean it. And I'll get in conversations. And the woman at the monopoly around the corner, she, um, she's, she's always like, oh, you are so polite. It's such a pleasure when you're in here. So it goes a long way. And I mean, obviously, I'm not trying to get free food out of, out of monopoly. <laughs> but it's, um, I don't know, it just opens doors when, when, you know, it's kind of like smile at the world and they'll smile back at you. Yeah. So I, it yeah. really works in France. I yeah, think. I didn't go into that uh, part of the book because I, I, I knew people here who spoke French, but I loved when you wrote about saying bonjour to everyone, the mm-hmm. magic of the sm- the magic of bonjour, I think is what you called it. Yes. And that was so beautifully written um, Thank you. in the book. Yeah, it's, it's totally legitimately true. I do that all the time for everybody and end up in a lot of conversations. And even when you speak French or learning French, it's a good way of um, just enjoying life, I think. I think it's a good way to enjoy these small interactions that, that we all have so many of them, but we don't necessarily make the most out of them. I think sometimes. Our time is just about up. Uh, any other questions? Any more questions or would you like to yeah. something else? You know, I'm going to let you do the honors uh, and pull the name out of the hat for, I'll let you begin. <laughs> or, guess, or what who? Forgot, guess what I forgot to do. <laughs> Oh, here we go. <laughs> okay, so I have, well, then I can do it actually because Phil was going to do one and I was going to do the other, so I can just do both. <laughs> oh. Ta da da. Oh, you can't see because of my f- fake image. But you have, I do have something. Oh. I'm, yeah, it disappears. So we're going to pull it out and see who's good. Wait, what, one question before we go. 
Yeah. Besides um, Phil, Blair, Pat, Stacy, where are we in the world? Oliver's in Paris. Yeah. I'm. Oh, in... We're here in Kaneohe, Hawaii. Oh, Kanai. Okay, so. So. Um, it's you and me, Oliver. We're we're the only <laughs> ones that are not in Hawaii. Paul. I'm representing the world. Yes, Paul. Well, that's me. Yes. Oh, I thought you were going to say. Oh yeah, I was going to say something. Yeah. Well, maybe um, about a decade ago, um, uh, we lived for a short time in, in your neighborhood on Avenue Lock, uh, oh, yeah. uh, right near the, uh, not too far from the Pont d'Alma. And okay. uh, I imagine it probably hasn't changed much, uh, maybe less traffic, um, but we really like that neighborhood. And um, I think you are in that neighborhood. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Avenue Rap is just uh, the you know that really beautiful door. Um, the, uh, about, the Art Deco. Yeah, the Art Deco uh, one from Avi Roth is about uh, one Roth minute walk away from where we were living. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Yeah. lovely. Yeah, well, I wanted to ask you just one question um, with regard to sort of life during this uh, atypical period. What about the you know the the markets like? Um, the Rue Claire Market, the, um, uh, the um, Avenue Wilson on the other side. Well, you know, do they function normally or? Yeah, they, they basically now they're kind of thriving again. But uh, during the lockdown, they were totally gone, except for a couple, which were in um, like, in sort of like, uh, like the 18th, 19th sort of area. Uh, they were still going even during lockdown. It was it was a bit weird, but here and uh, like Rue Montego and stuff, totally back to normal. If you walk there now, you wouldn't even know that anything had happened. So uh, it took a while to get there. Like there was distancing and masks and stuff for a while, but now it's. If you went there today on Sunday on Rue Claire, I think you would. It would be amazing if you could tell that there'd been a lockdown two months ago. Hmm. Were people wearing masks? Not really. No, people, I think people feel like they should, but uh, it's kind of like, look, no one else is doing it. So no one seems to care, except when you go into, um, like, uh, if you go into a museum or whatever, they make you wear it. What about on the metro or the bus? Or... I never, almost as a rule, go on metro or buses because I walk <laughs> everywhere or cycle or take the scooter. So I, don't, I haven't been on the metro during the whole thing, but I think you do have to wear it, I think, but I don't know. I'm the wrong guy to ask. I can tell you about scooters. You don't need to wear one on a scooter. <laughs> That's excellent. Well, let me do the, uh, the honors and see who. Okay. And the winner for one copy is Paul Switzer. Fancy hey. that. <laughs> I can't get it to him though. Which I'll hold it down a bit, but yeah. For Paul, me, you're, you're directly you're, above him. Yeah. Yes. So, Paul, you have won uh, a copy of, uh, of Paris on Air, um, and we will get that to you. We'll figure out how. Um, get your address. Uh, we have one more. Let's see. We'll mail it to you, Paul. Okay. So we have two copies, yeah. And the second one goes to, ah, Pat Lee. Hey. Oh, hey. <laughs> so Pat, that means when you go to Paris, you can get yours autographed. Right. Sure. Will I you be there you... for What did you say? Will you be in this apartment for long? Just for about two weeks, I think. And then you'll be back in well, the we, we, I think we're going to um I think we're gonna to go to Sweden for a, a little bit. Uh because we can travel in Europe now. And uh, Lena has a, like, a, there's a lot more space in Sweden and we would, wouldn't mind sort of stretching our legs, but then we'll be back after a while. I might even, I might even take a holiday, Pat. I haven't, I haven't decided yet, but. Well, I know. <laughs> I will. When are you coming here? Empty. The place is empty right now. Oh my goodness. Wow, that sounds right. amazing. Number 12. Number 12. Okay. Well, maybe I'll deliver your book to your, uh. <laughs> do you, uh, Blair, do you want to propose a toast to the... Yes, yes. So we can uh, send him on his way officially. We want to thank you. It's been such a, a 
privilege yeah. and pleasure to have you with us this past hour. So we're going to toast you. Uh, some of us have glasses of wine or a coupe, uh, a glass of water. I think that's bad luck. Um, oh, goodness. <laughs> I'll go back to my tea. There we go. So here's to um, success. I know that you mentioned uh, in your interview this past week that you could do uh, another book of the past five years and have completely different stories. That's how full your life is and how observant you are. So we will look forward to that um, and expect that to be no less successful than the success you've had with Paris on air. So thank you, Oliver. Merci infiniment. Merci. 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 Merci.